Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Neil Pickup, the fat lad here with you in the mother fluffing house, and it's time to ring the bell on the old school. As always, I'm joined by my co-host for this show, Bobby Brown, with his knackered phone. Keeps flipping out on our ass. <laughs> I won't mind. Bobby's not shy of a few quid. Won't even invest in a new phone. What's that tell you about, Bob? Hey, come on, Bob. You've thrown thousands of dollars into arm wrestling competitions. You put a massive big save in for the WEF championships that never was in 2017. And you're working with that phone. You need to talk me through that at some point, although not now. Well, sometimes, <laughs> I'm nice guy. sometimes I'm a nice guy, and most times I'm a cheap, tight ass. <laughs> <laughs> His missus will be in the background behind the phone. Yeah. Going, uh, uh. <laughs> and uh, our other co-host and the backbone of the old school, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Eric Rissant of Canada. Uh, I'll tell you what, we 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 have just come off the back of the last show. If you didn't. If you didn't see it, I'm going to put a link in the description, the over-the-top episode. And what became clear when we walked through that episode was the lack of clarity, the sort of mystery that surrounds that whole event. Yes. It, because it was obviously being captured for uh, the film, there's very little footage of the film. Because it was so disjointed in terms of the manner in which it ran, it's difficult to get sort of joined up stories from people around that. Very, very, it's kind of a weird cataclysm of a tournament, isn't it? It's just a tough thing to piece together and yet so influential. Now, I think to start this one, Eric, you were going to talk about sort of the late 80s and some of the events that happened in the immediate aftermath or the years following over the top. And where did you want to start with that, mate? Right, so in the last episode, I talked about the North American Championships in Amos, but another big series of events was this, the events that Bob Howell ran at the Sands Hotel in Reno, Nevada. Um, he usually ran one or two events a year, and at the end of the 80s, they were called the International Championships. And this was, in, in I think in 88, 89, it may have been the biggest pro, uh, biggest prize money tournaments in North America, or maybe even the world. You know, about, probably about $10,000 in those days, so maybe twenty or $30,000 today. And always, always stacked with talent because it's so close to the Cal- – the California always had a lot of strong heavy hitters in those days. They would all go to this event, and it was enough to attract John Brzezink, Gary Goodrich, Richard Lufkis, uh, Dave Patton uh, from, from the, the Midwest or the East Coast. Um, so the, the, there were some classic matches there. Some of this video is available on RMTV, uh, but where you'll see – for example, I think it was 88 where, uh, you know, Richard would beat John, uh, but then Gary would beat Richard and then John would beat Gary. These very interesting triangles. And if you were to speak to, I know, I actually, I remember seeing it in the, in when you interviewed Richard that he has held Gary in very high regard in terms of on the strength department. Yeah. Uh, Gary off, often gave him trouble. I don't even. I'm not even sure if he has a winning record against Gary. It's probably close. Um, I think he said he had. I think he, he said did, he okay. had a winning record on Gary and John. Okay. Um, but I think Gary was, and Gary has a winning record on John, as I understand it as well. Okay. If so, it, it's 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 close. It might only be by a match or, or so, you know. But you know, yeah. those three those those three guys went back and forth, uh, no doubt about it. And once again, it's all it's it gets a little boring because it's always the same names who won these events. Dave Patton would go to would win. Alan Fisher would win his class. John, uh, you know, in 87, John pulled and won three classes. So that's not the year that I'm talking about uh, of these matches. But in 88, in 88, uh, there were seven classes, and all seven were won by three guys. Dave Patton, John Brzezink, Gary Goodrich. <laughs> so of the seven <laughs> classes total, they split them up in three ways. And uh, that's one of the things that you've got to sort of – always keep in the back of your mind about John as well, is the fact that often when he faced these big boys, he'd already won two classes. Yeah, and, and, and it's, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. not like those classes were just full of bums. <laughs> it, no, you know, no. those classes had some serious arm wrestlers in there. Right. Yeah, and yet it. he still went on, yeah. faced the bigger men, and on occasion overturned them as well. You right. know, so just a, not that I want to big up John more than he currently is, but my God. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, and the same months. thing said to seven classes. Uh, I'm guessing, you know, three of the classes were won. I'm going to guess and say three of the classes were won by Dave. Three of the classes are won by John. And one of the classes was won by Gary, simply because Gary was probably the biggest of them all and could only pull the heavyweight. I'm, I mean, yeah. I'm guessing, but. So in some of these years in the late 80s, they were starting to have left-hand classes, and Gary was very oh. good. So Gary would in the left hit supers and the right supers. Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah. 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 And Dave also, he wasn't, his left wasn't his right, but he still won plenty with his left when there were left-hand classes. Right. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so the Sands tournament, I believe 1989 was the last year it was held. Um but what started in the late 80s as well was what became the dominant event of the first half of the 90s. Uh, Yukon Jack, it was a new Canadian liqueur. They were looking for a way to market it. Yeah. They approached a marketing company and they're like, we want to tie, tie this with a sport. Our image is young, male, rugged men. What would go well with that? And yeah. the marketing department was looking at what was available and they said, well, what about arm wrestling? And they said, let's try it. In 88 and 89, they did it in, a te- in two test markets in the Northeast U.S. And they ran uh, an event in Albany, New York, I think, the first year. They, ra- they ran a tournament on a weeknight, and then they ran another tournament the day after, at maybe another local bar. And then on the Thursday, it was the winners of the two events that would face in each class. So three-way classes. 160, uh, at the time it was 160, 190 in supers and one women's class. Um, and then the winners would face off in, in, in on the, on the Thursday night. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, those tournaments were very well attended because there were cash prizes, uh, in those regional tournaments. They were, it wasn't huge, but it was enough that people were very interested. And, and it was a success in 88. They did want, they wanted to test it again in early 89 in, in Connecticut, I think. And it went very well there. And they said, all right, let's do it. For 1990, we're doing a series of 10 qualifiers across the U.S. We're at every qualifier, the top three or four qualify for the finals, and that's going to be a big money event. Yeah. Um, so similar to over the top, similar to any of these regional WPA, they've all done the same thing, but this, they were very good. Uh, every town they would, every city they would go, they'd get on the news, newspaper, TV, um, and, and, and then, so what would happen is the end of year championships was a very stacked event. Um, and in the super heavyweight class in April 1990, the finals in Chicago, who makes it to the finals? John Brzezink, Richard Lovkins. Um, on that particular day, that particular day, I think in their previous encounter may have been the Barry tournament. So, uh, Richard had demolished John a year earlier. There was um, some footage out, wasn't there, on that not long yes, ago? Yes, sport videos. Our sport videos. Yeah. I just put that on YouTube, yeah. Um, the over-the-top, oh, sorry, not over-the-top, the Yukon Jack finals, I, had, I haven't seen footage of that. It might exist somewhere, but I haven't seen it. But I understand it was a tight match, uh, but that John ultimately won that class. Mm-hmm. Um, Patton, sure enough, won the 160 class. And the 190 class was won by uh, a guy by the name of Jerry Nelson, who's a Washington uh, puller yeah. Old time bowler, he was very good. He started in the seventies, but in the eighties were, were his heyday. And he won that inaugural, uh, final. And, um, Grace Ann Swift out of New York won the, yeah. uh, the Yukon Jack. She was already WAF champion at that time. Mm-hmm. They loved the Yukon Jack. Very happy. Sales, all the sales had increased about 3% a year in those years. And they were satisfied. They're like, that's enough. We're doing this again. Second yep. season. Same type of thing, year in championships in Tampa. First three years, 90, 90, 91, 92, the prize money is probably 10 or 15 grand at the finals. Um, but it's building momentum. Um, 93, uh, they up the number of cities and it goes to San Francisco for the finals. And who comes out of retirement in 93 or I guess he came out in maybe 92, 93? Cleve Dean. Cleve Haven't seen him since seven years. Yeah, and he he wants the money, he wants the attention, and, and he gets to the finals. Uh, UConn Jack, nineteen ninety uh, three. Who does he face? John Brzezink. And um, John Brzezink at this point has never beat Cleveland. Never, never beat him. But he knew 
that if he's going to have a chance, it's going to be arm to arm. He's not going to, he's not going to be able to top rope cleave. And John executes perfection, gets him inside, and he, and he, and he pins Cleve Dean, and the crowd goes wild. It's, uh, I wish I would have been to see that. You remember what I talked about when John pulled, uh, the Georgia Giant and gripped him low around the wrist and turned him yep. into a hook? Yeah. That's exactly what John did to Cleve Dean, uh, in that year. I was, I was there that year. Uh, it is, it would be a very valid statement to say, if not for Yukon Jack, I've never moved to Utah, I never own a bar, and I'm not sitting in a house in Mesquite, Nevada as my winter house, if not for those Yukon Jack tournaments. Wow. Because I went to the Yukon Jack tournaments, I qualified, uh, I forget exactly the first year, but I qualified for that San Francisco event. I go to the San Francisco event. Obviously, I know who John Brzezink is, but I don't really know him. Somehow, I end up having a beer and talking to Bill Brzezink and Kevin Bongard, who I say, hey, I'm going to the WPAA World Championships in Vegas in October. How about we all meet there, and then afterwards, I'll come up to Utah like for a little vacation. And so that's what happened. We went. We arm wrestled. I came up to Utah. I wasn't working at the time. I see unbelievable snow skiing and, more importantly, rock climbing. And I'm like, holy crap. I've got rock climbing, snow skiing, and great arm wrestlers. I'm moving here. Oh. I never put it on that. <laughs> I like I it, man. And I moved out three months later. I and like your work. That never would have happened if it wasn't for that Yukon Jack Finals tournament. I didn't have to move to Utah. So that's why we should have a toast with Yukon Jack, you know, right now. Where's my bottle? Still, <laughs> are, are Yukon Jack still rocking? Are they still going? Yeah, they still, yeah, it's a drink. I mean, it's still an alcohol. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, so you, you mix it with some lime juice and make a snake bite. Sliding doors, mate. My God, it's funny how things work out, isn't it? But yeah. 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 The, the, so, sorry, Eric, go. I was just going to say, every year the finals became more and more and more stacked. Uh, 91, for example, uh, Johnny Walker won the middleweight class, 40, 46 years of age, uh, still kicking ass. Um, Dave Patton, of course, won again. This is the Dave Patton. Basically, any light, almost any lightweight class that Dave Patton entered between 1980 and 1995. He, you know, he won 90, 98% of them. Yeah. Um, he was incredibly uh, good. That 91, Ron finished second to John. Ron Bass finished second to John uh, in the in the Supers. And Dot Jones got wind of this event, so she started attending and she started winning. Where where was the, where was the 91 finals? 91 and 92 were both in Tampa, Florida. Okay. And they went back to okay. Florida in 96, so didn't they? Yeah. So then my, yeah. So then my, I think my first finals was in Florida. And then after that, there was one in New York City. In 95, yeah. Okay, so I must have gone to Tampa, and then I went to San Francisco, and then I went to New York. They had two San Frans in a row, 93, 94 San Fran. Yeah. Okay, then I would have been at both of them. I went went to San Fran, 94, 95, New York, and Florida. Because in 90. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe at one one of the years John lost or had a hard time in a heavyweight division and decided to just go to the middleweights. Yeah, that's ninety four, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> ninety five, he went to the middleweights. He yeah, was in the middleweights. Yeah, yeah, ninety four, went to the middleweights in ninety five. Did, did he lose yeah. Gary Goodrich? Correct. Yes, he lost the, right. Yeah. And and John, you know, I mean, back then and still today. You know, it's all about the dollar. I mean, do yeah. you, especially for that particular tournament, in 1995, do I think John could have, John, would John have won the heavyweight division? I would say probably yes. Well, what, in 95? But in the 95s, uh, definitely yes. You know, so I think there was like 10 grand on the line. You don't mm. mess around. You go grab that 10 grand, and then if you want to, you know, go after the big dog after that on some side table, well, then go ahead. But you've got to get that 10 grand first. <laughs> yeah, that which is exactly what John did. Yeah. Exactly what John yeah. did. 
And that's yeah. where rarely in my life have I seen John call someone out onto the practice table. It's always been the other way around. Yes. But in '95 in New York, he literally called Gary to the to pull. Yeah. Right, sort of said, you, you know, come on, because I think he'd had a relatively easy day. Um, yeah. The way that it worked out, his only really his only slowdown was Johnny Walker, and that was moderate. You know, and we'll go okay. back in a minute because I want to talk about the early uh, UConn's mate because I'm sure there was some awesome stuff there. But just digressing for a moment into the '95 show, he had a yeah. slight slowdown from uh, from Johnny Walker. Um, on the brother. other side, you had his brother, you had Lee Holland from the UK, um, and and that was that. But right. after the tournament, when he was fresh, he called Gary over to the practice table and they were pulling on the practice table. I have some home video footage of that somewhere. Uh, Gary that day was immoral. Yeah. Yeah. Immoral. Unbelievably strong. He was, he was, you know, when you can see someone, uh, it's one of the few times that I've seen John connected and shaking his whole body and the whole man shaking and Gary like this. <laughs> like, no problem. Like very easy. Yeah. Just, and yeah. I remember at the time thinking, Shit. yeah, <laughs> like that. And I've spoken to John since. I'm sure you have as well. He always used I, to, you know, particularly when we did in the in the presence of greatness, and we were talking. Uh, Engin had, had, had the a question addressed to him about the modern day top class heavyweights versus the old top class heavyweights, and John was absolutely categorically adamant that, no, that, believe me, the top guys of the past were just as strong as they are now. And yeah. if you sort of injected an, an, an old Cleve Dean into pull anybody right now, they're in a match. Or a prime Richard Lucas against anybody you want ever at any time, trust me, they're in a match. And, and he also mentioned that. He said Gary, when Gary was at his absolute peak, ridiculously strong. And he said, and the thing was, everybody had Gary down as a top roller, more, you know, the majority, because obviously his matches with well, Cleve, where you'd see him with that massive right. back pressure, even though he had a pretty small hand, to be honest. But, but he yeah, said, trust me, Gary's hook as well. Oh, he said, at his peak, unbelievable. And Gary could exactly. pull anywhere. 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 Absolutely anywhere you want. Wrist, yeah. flat and back, you, you name it. You know, anyway, we, we're getting yeah. off, we're getting off topic, George. We're, we're, get, we're, we're gonna get, we're yeah. gonna get there, but if I go back, let's say the 92, 92, uh, John Brzezink wins the heavies. Dave wins the lights. Middleweight was won uh, by Cobra, which 190 is a bit of a heavyweight for Andrew. Uh, but he beat Bill Brzezink in the finals. That is the heaviest weight I've ever yeah. seen. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think he weighed 190. But oh, that, no, he didn't weigh. No. no. I, so, I, I guarantee you Cobra has never weighed over 175 pounds in his whole life, ever. I've, sir, I've never seen him heavier than that. Basically, never. you know, actually heavier. Making that win all the more impressive were Bill Brzezink, Gary Stain, Robert Lear. These are tough, tough guys in those years. So yeah. Yeah. impressive. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Dot Jones won the women. Dot Jones won every other women's UConn Jack event. I mean, like I said, she has an almost perfect record. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> 93, what, that was an interesting year as well because Alan Fisher had been away out of the sport for about six years. After Over the Top, he's another guy who disappeared. Um, Jeez, he, I did not know that, Eric. Yeah, no, he said life got in the way. He was doing very little pulling between uh, between 87 and 93. Wow. Uh, he came out in 93, and um, he makes it to the finals of the lightweight class and yep. actually beats Dave Patton. So yep. that was uh, – Dave Dave has the winning record between the two, but uh, that was one year that Alan, Alan beat him at the biggest show. The biggest so, show record. earlier that day – we're walking around the streets of San Francisco, uh, and I see – actually, I was walking with John and Bill, I think, and Alan had a V-shaped gripper in his hand, and he's just gripping it and gripping it. This is all before the tournament. And I said, well, what do you think of that? And he goes, well, I really thought he'd have won the tournament that day, but when he – this is all before – he goes, yeah, but Dave Patton's going to win now because I don't know why he's doing that. He's tiring out his hand right now. Well, apparently, no. And <laughs> later that day, uh, Alan wins the class. Huh. Yep. Yep. Fascinating. Because so, I, was, I was in that class that day, and uh, uh, I, I did okay, but I wasn't I, – I, it was not a good day. And, you know, I, don't, I, I couldn't have beaten uh, Alan or, or Dave uh, back then. But um, 
but it was it was a fun day. It was a good day. What were the other names in there, Bob? Who were the other big guns in there? Because the Yukon always used to, like Eric saying, attract uh, a, a, a sea full of monsters. Oh, so do you know the Brandon brothers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, whose first names I'm forgetting. They were both in there. Um, Bill Ballinger was in there. Uh, I believe Mike McGraw was in there. Um, it was Ray Patton. Ray. Ray was pulling, was he? Little lighter, but I, yes, I do believe Ray was there. Uh, most people, you know, just like Bill Berzink, most people have no idea how good Ray Patton and Bill Berzink were. They were <laughs> monsters. Yeah. You know, they were monsters. Um, right, uh, Ryan Hutchings took third in that. Ryan Hutchins, that's right. Bloody hell, Ryan Hutchins, yeah, Jesus. That, that, yeah, I beat that guy in a qualifier, and then, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so. And in the middleweights, uh, Johnny Walker. I don't know if Johnny Walker was there in, in 92, but in 93 he won it. He beat Bill, yeah. and Cobra took third that year. Yep. And then the Supers. Uh, yeah, John Brzezink defeated Cleve, as we talked about, and Gary took third, Ron took fourth. So these are right. tough tournaments. Tough tournaments. Well, so stacked, stacked I want, classes I want, put, well. I want to put it in a little perspective, because back then, was it still 160 or is it 165? 65, I believe. It, it, it okay. became 65 in 95. So up till 94. Oh, okay. okay. Interesting. Yeah. So it was still 160. Yeah. So I was still pulling in the 160s. And I'm telling you that back then, I guarantee you walking around soaking ring and wet or, 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 or with a full stomach was still Cobra Rhodes at probably about 170 pounds. Okay. Uh, Cobra Rhodes probably could have skipped a meal and made 160. Yeah. But he chose not to because he yeah. thought that pulling against Dave Patton was equally as hard as pulling against the guys in the 190s. So why not just go after the 190s? What's the difference? And, I mean, that just goes to tell you that, you know, Dave Patton probably could have stepped into the 190s in that day and potentially won. Same with Alan Fisher. Potentially could have won the day that Cobra Rhodes got third. Interestingly, were there any hard and fast rules in the Yukons about pulling multiple classes, Eric? I've never seen that published or looked into it, but I'm assuming there must have been. One class, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you're you're only allowed one class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which makes perfect sense. Like Eric said, the qualifiers, you pulled a tournament on Tuesday night and you got a winner. And anyone could pull another tournament on Wednesday night, right. except for the guy who got first right. on Tuesday night, right. and you get another winner, and then both of the winners came back on Thursday and would win, would mm-hmm. win the qualifying spot to uh, the championship. And whatever the money was, I forget what right. the money was. Yeah, it was, it was, I think I think in the regions in those years, it may have been 200 bucks. It wasn't. It Something was, like that. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and that was, yeah, that was by far the biggest tournament of the time, you know, and all because Yukon Jack was looking for a way to advertise their liquor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what was the year, I want to say 93 or 94, that Remes went over, Sharon Remes? And I, I need to, you could, if you check back on the channel on the deep inside, you'll see that Remes went over there one year for the Yukon Jack. And he, he pulled I'm it. Trying I'm to, trying to remember for the life of me what year it was. Well, I'm trying to remember the first time I met Sharon Ramez, whether it was at Yukon Jack, because I don't think he was there in 95. No. No, he wasn't. He wasn't there in 95. 90s. It was, it was um, one of the San Francisco events, I believe. Well, it's crazy. If he was there... He mentioned it on one of the, when I did his uh, the Deep Inside episode. He brought it up, and I'm like, no way. He said, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was a qualifying event or a finals, and I can't remember which. And he went over to one of the Yukon Jacks, which I had previously hadn't known that. Well, I can't imagine it was the finals because I was at the finals, and I just can't imagine him not being in 
the finals or the yeah. top three. And yet I don't he wasn't. So I'm gonna check back, I'll check back on his yeah, deep inside yeah, after that, this. Sure. Do the same, ladies and gents, get over there, have a look. It's all on the deep inside with uh, Sharon Romes. But uh in in terms of the sort of ninety four event, what were the big stories coming out of that, Eric? Well, 94, 94 was big because they doubled the number of qualifiers um, in the U.S. And they had uh, – so it was still North American, a North American event, but uh, Dave Patton gets his revenge. He beats Allen in the final of 94. Um, it was – 94 would be the last – the final major event that Johnny Walker would win. So 49 years old. And he won his third Yukon Jack middleweight title. I mean, that's unbelievable. That's, uh, and he, he, he beat, uh, Bill Berzink in the final of that one. But the story, if you've seen footage, I saw it circulating recently, the Yukon Jack footage of the super, of the heavyweight class with Cleve, Gary, John. It's, yeah. there are some matches in there that are <laughs> screaming, career ending death wars. Yes. Uh, Just face. The, the, the match between John Brzezink and Gary Goodridge is one of the best of all time. I mean, it's, it's such a good match to look at, you know, such great pulling, you know? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, um, ultimately, so, uh, ultimately in the final, it, it was uh, Gary and Cleve. Um, I don't know if Cleve pulled John in the event. I can't remember if Gary pulled, I'm sorry, if Cleve pulled John. Because I have a feeling John would have probably won that, unless he was tired from another match. But um, the first, so I think, in any event, I know Gary got one win on Cleve, but Cleve got two wins on Gary. And I think um, Jerry was Gary was a little uh, burnt out, because I think fresh for fresh, knowing how to pull, I think he would have beat Gary that, uh, he would have beat Cleve that year. But the big man came out on top. Uh, you know, Cleve Dean was in his 40s at this time. Um, to, to win that event in that class is something else. You know, I don't think it was re- – he probably, for one of the first times ever, I don't think Cleve was the favorite going into that event because John had in the previous year. Mm-hmm. Um, but he won it. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, because you said earlier on when we were speaking – uh, about the situation with John Brzezink, knowing that if he was going to win, it would be arm on arm. Right. But it takes a lot of balls to do that with someone who, of that, that magnitude, somebody of that stature. And right. interestingly, in 94, uh, and again, in 95, actually, but let's concentrate on 94, Gary chose the other option, where he was going to try and rip his hand open and blast him outside his shoulder, uh, and did it successfully once. Yeah. Um, now, if you choose to do that, particularly with Gary, who didn't have particularly big long levers, had a small hand, and that, for people who are watching the show, you probably don't appreciate the size of the hand on Cleve Dean. I pulled Cleve in an overall at the World Championships, and it was physically impossible to set up with Cleve. Cleve, it's just ridiculous. His hand was absolutely massive it was stupidly big and 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 his arm was stupidly tall so he's moving his elbow to the back of the pad and you can't get a comfortable position because he's so massive and so gary attempting to top roll him once cleave show, throws that shoulder in there and starts to go for the press which he did effectively you don't have a great deal of options right because you've run out of height and trying to stop a, a man of that size and that top end Right. Good luck with that. But there are fun matches. If you can find those oh. on YouTube, they're incredible. It's yeah. <laughs> absolutely arm wrestling at its best. It's wild, wild west arm wrestling, ladies and gents. Yeah. Just trying to rip each other to pieces. And Gary obviously went on to his fight career, and you can see all that aggression and fight coming out in that match. He tries to destroy yeah. him. It's absolute quality. And a little true story for you as well. Speaking to Cleve uh, at the World Championships, right? Um, we went to the World Championships after that, and um, I was speaking to him. I think it was ninety. Where the hell was it? Ninety four, ninety six. Speaking to him at one of the World Championships after it, and he said to me, and I think I'm going to say nineteen ninety four, Sweden. Okay, and he said that he was really torn up after that match. 
I was saying to him, oh, I saw the matches. I think it was um, Aaron Lingell had the bloody footage of the, the, the Yukon Jack, and they were watching it at one of the hotels, watching the match. And I'm going, and anyway, I clocked Dean, and I, uh, clicked Dean, and I walked over to him and said, oh, whoa, i just seen that match with you and Gary. <laughs> like, holy, that was incredible. And Cleve yeah. was saying, yeah, I still feel that. Like, it damaged me permanently. <laughs> never never got over the damage that he experienced from that match. So that shows you the am- amount of side pressure going in. But, uh, but how, t- how many times do you think Cleve Dean was ever in a long match like that? Mm. And particularly when he engaged his shoulder and was driving around and still couldn't finish because Gary's just ripping so hard into him. Unbelievable. But to be fair though, that that World Championship in 94 was less than three weeks after the Yukon Jack Finals. So I, I believe that he still felt it because it was less than three weeks. So... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Wow. Now, 95, I figure we'll just stay on Yukon Jack and maybe go back on talk about other stuff, but Yukon Jack 95, in my opinion, was possibly the strongest field of any Yukon Jack. I agree. It, it, it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, A, they made the, they pumped up the money. They made the slight change in the weight classes. So it was 165, uh, 198 and up. And opened it up to international pullers. Yeah. Um, and um, they changed the qual Instead of having 20 qualifiers, 13 or 15 or 20 qualifiers, they only had four qualifiers each in 95 and 96. And these were big events. You know, obviously, if you want to get to the big show, you have to finish top three at one of these four qualifiers. And they're open to international athletes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that to win a reg- to reg- to win a regional, uh, meant something. <laughs> it's like sort of, uh, in the w- winning a wild qualifier when in a regional championship. It's, it's that similar, uh, level. Uh, and, um, the winners would get a buy. So John Brzezink, or sorry, Cleve Dean, I guess that year, uh, Dave Patton, they'd get buys to the finals, but everyone else had to qualify. Um, so it, it, those events in 95 and 96 were unbelievable. I'm just trying to pull up the, the list of, of. I know some- in 95, you had guys there like, uh, absolute greats, like a young and emerging Svetan Gashevsky was there. Uh, there was the 90 kilo Georgian. Oh God. Brain fail. Where's Engin when I need him? 90 kilo Georgian world champion. I can't remember his name. He was there. Uh, Lee Holland was there. He took, uh, second place at the world championships in the 220s, uh, at the WAF from the UK. Um, Jason Vale was let, let, there. Let, I have the list. Chusero. I have the list. Freaks. I have the list for the lightweights and the heavyweights, top eight. Listen to this top eight, lightweights, 95. Dave, Dave Patton first. Denny Zebray, Serge So, Jason Vale, Andreas Rundstrom, Vepkia Sankaradze, Chad Silvers, Alan Fisher. That's the top eight. Any of those guys, you know, that's... <laughs> I mean, that's ace, isn't it? Yeah. In the heavyweights, Gary Goodrich, Cleve Dean, Jerry Cataret, Ron Bath, Eric Wolfell, Garvin Lewis, Zauer, Tekadadze, David yeah. Randall. I mean, my <laughs> God. Dave Randall. Yeah. Eighth place. I mean, my God. And Dave Randall, animal. You know? Yeah. And he won in the, he won in the hunt. Yeah. And Gary, and, and to, to be fair, Gary that year, like you said, he was heads and shoulders above everyone. Uh, so yeah. Gary was very strong in those years. It's. Yeah. Stop. In the middleweight class, uh, John, your winner, obviously. Yes. Uh, Johnny Walker, Lee Holland, Bill Brzezink. Uh, who else was in there? Can't remember who else was in there. I know, uh, did Garth make the, Garth Carlson make the top, top few as well? It's possible. Mm-hmm. He, was, he wasn't top three, but I think he was there. Oh, sorry, I have the list here. So it went John, Bill, uh, Lee Holland, George Gibbons. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Botafogo and Paul Walter were the top six. Okay, yeah. So just stupid. <laughs> yeah, that was absolutely unbelievable categories. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So most I miss it most like people that. don't know Paul Walters. Um, Paul Walters started in New Jersey. He started at a practice up north that I used to go to and, and train some guys. And uh, I consider Paul Walter the greatest practice puller that's ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm telling you, Ron, you ask Ron Bath. Ron Bath can't do anything with Paul Walters in a practice. <laughs> Yet, when tournament time rolls around, Paul sometimes has problems. But you know, he, 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 was a fra- he, was, he is a freight train. I mean, mm-hmm. he's a monster. And for those of you who don't know who Lee Holland was from Paul. the U.K., Lee Holland is the dad of the lean machine Tom Holland of WAL fame. Uh, now, yeah. Now, Lee Holland was a, a very close friend of mine, training partner of mine, two, a bigger man than me at that time, 220 kilo guy, iron strong, Four, forearm, like great boys, just a, just a ridiculous forearm, wrists, massive wrists, absolute right. unit, just as wide as he was tall, but unbelievably explosive, massive hitter. Uh, yeah, I mean, he went through George Gibbons like he wasn't there. Just wow. carved through him like a hot knife through butter. Wow. I'm talking literally George Gibbons. When George was coming off the table, uh, he said, Jesus Christ, that guy's ridiculous, Neil. I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he, I get hit like that every, every week. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so One thing that, that helped, uh, 95, that's the year that John w- went back down to the middleweights. But what helped is it changed from a 190 to a 198. So it wasn't as much of a stretch. Not that John was that much heavier, but I'm sure the 188, 198 was more appealing than 190 for John. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And like um, you said, only with that field of heavyweights, I mean, the field of heavyweights that you just read out. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Just read that heavyweight division one more time, Eric. That's yeah. ridiculous. Top, top eight, Gary Goodrich, Cleve Dean, Jerry Cataret, Ron Bath, Garvin Lewis, Eric Wolfell, Zaur, Skidadze, and David Randall. I mean... Garvin Lewis, I don't know. I, I don't know if many people might not Garvin know. Garvin Lewis, Lewis unbelievable. was, Gary, was Gary, Gary Goodrich's cousin. And yep. he looked like, you know, a, a right. very intimidating-looking muscular. Arms were massive. Right. Massive arms right. on Garvin. Now, and isn't, isn't Zaur... Isn't that the Georgia Giants? Yeah, that's, that was the Georgia Giants. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So he only took seventh, so. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Seventh and Randall. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Randall. Hey. <laughs> Holy. Let's be right. Ken, uh, Ken Taylor uh, was one of the referees for the U contract. Ken Taylor's a Canadian who was a referee uh, for many years and previously a puller. And he shared a story with me. I don't know if it was from 95 or 94, but it was following probably 94. It was following one of the wars between Gary Goodrich and Cleve Dean. Maybe it was the the first match of the finals where Gary won, I think. And they had a war. And, Gary, you know, Cleve Dean, heavy man, he's not in the greatest shape. And after the after the first match, he's like, I need time. I need time. I, my heart can't take it. I, 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 need, I need a break. And Ken Taylor goes to Gary, goes, uh, you know, you're up right now. Do you, do you want to give him the time? And Gary goes to Cleve, Cleve, I'm sorry, but get your ass back up here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually, now that you, I remember that, actually, yes. I remember Cleve not being happy about having to get back up. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. Yeah, there's serious money on the line. It's oh. happening, and it's happening now. I love it. Yeah. You know, money, mate, money separates the, the men from the boys, doesn't it? I mean, you only have to look at Travis Bajant versus Jerry Cataret. Friends oh, walking yeah. in. That when you get to the table, yeah. <laughs> fifteen thousand dollars on the table. Forget the friendship <laughs> shit. He's on. Oh yeah. Ninety five is also arguably for me the peak year for Denny's Bray, and I know there's a lot of controversy from the final match between Dave Patton and Denny's Bray, and whether there was whether it was fair or not. Ultimately, uh, Dave was the winner of that tournament, um, but they both returned for ninety six. And Denny's Bray, I mean, he beat Dave convincingly. Cracked him early, uh, didn't he? Early yeah. doors. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. who else was there to win and the Andreas Lakers? Rundström. Andreas Rundström. Andreas Rundström. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. At, at, at his peak as well. Yeah. yeah. So I feel yeah. bad for Denny because he was so mm-hmm. strong in those years, but he never won one of the, these types of events. You know, he was all, always, uh, well, actually, I think he may have won it in one of the main events, but he was right there at Yukon Jack, but he just second place two years in a row. Right. 96 is, you know, similarly stacked. I, I give the slight edge to 95, but 96 in the lightweights, Andreas, Denny Zabray, Bill Ballinger, Dave Patton, yeah. Jason Bale, Mike McGraw. Um, 
Ballinger cracked Andreas in the first round. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, wow. Over there, remember, Charlie Minnell and Andreas, and he lost that pull against Bill Ballinger, and we were like, oh, no way. And then he came back and cracked everyone. Wow. You know, got it, find his, found his groove and, and was kicking ass again. But, again, stupidly stacked tournament, yeah. just immoral. Yeah. Watch it. And, I, and I've spoken with Andreas about this, because if you watch the way Andreas <laughs> arm wrestles, he arm wrestles, you know, with his arm at a 90-degree angle, pretty far away from his body. Most people would there say, is. you know, get closer, get closer. And uh, I asked him where where did he learn to arm wrestle like that, and uh, basically it was from Leslie Wims out of uh, out of the Maryland area, 132 pound four time world champ, because Leslie would start that exact same way, pretty far away from his body, and uh, I just I just thought that was an interesting side note about Andreas, because yeah he's mm-hmm. a he was unbelievably strong and fast, and his hand and wrist were like iron. Yeah, and he would take a very fair, very low grip and yeah. just go straight through you off the thumb. Great puller. Exactly. Absolutely fabulous puller. And yeah. originated a style which was from that, originated a style which was very unique to himself and uh, influenced an enormous amount of arm wrestlers, myself included, all over Western Europe. He was like, yeah, um, yeah one of the talismans of the West. Yeah. Great dude. Yeah. Yeah. The Runstrom brothers, Andreas and Jonas. Yeah. I, I, how do you say it? Uh, uh, Iron Yon on He mm. pulls the same way, yep. And, and Pascal Strad. Yeah, it basically it goes back to, to Leslie Wims. I don't know anyone before Leslie that would that pulled that way, but I, I'm sure someone did, you know. I just don't know who they were. Well, it's, it's interesting because the whole King's Move debate comes into that. You know, if, you, if you're talking about pronation and an open style of arm wrestler, you trace the steps back. They were there early doors, you know, in the early two thousands. Now, you know, Andreas Rundström won his first world title in 1994 in Sweden with that yeah. style of pulling. And at the yeah. same time, uh, you could talk Anatoly Manasiev there as well from the early 90s with his, yeah. I believe, I genuinely believe, maybe the original Kings mover before George Zakowitz. Mm. Because I certainly remember... Anatoly Manasseh doing that before I ever saw George Zakowitz do it. Right. Yeah, George George only started doing it mid nineties. Yeah, yeah. mid nineties, right. like ninety six. Not you know at Virginia Beach ninety six. George yeah. Zakowitz was there pulling. Manasseh was there pulling. Uh, you watch the two men at the table. Who's doing the king's move? Right. And I would argue uh, uh, Virgil Ar- 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 Virgil Arciero. Uh, would have the same arm type problem and would lower his body real hard to gain height. Very similar move running into the end of his arm, in my opinion. Um, there's another guy on the East Coast, uh, Burt Whitfield, legendary oh, well, arm wrestler. Burt, Burt Whitfield, mate, what a man. What, what a, and a, yeah, awesome guy. Love that guy. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, same, same type of, uh, you know, move and arm issue and, uh, but yeah, enough of that. Move off King's move. Stupid comments. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I go to the middle middleweight class of '96, you've gone, Jack. This is so John and Bill finish one and two, followed by Sylvain Perron. Sylvain Perron in this year, he's right below the Berzinks, but in my opinion, ahead of er, ahead of everyone else at that weight. Was that the league. year of Curacao? No, Curacao was '98. '98. Yeah, I'm say, we'll I'm get to that one. That's a, a special event. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All coming, guys. You know, I'm wrestling old school future episodes. We've got the main events. We've got Curacao all coming. But, yeah, that because Sylvain was – Sylvain's underrated, mate. In those years, he was – Sylvain, Sylvain Perot, I found this out. He he started pulling in 89. He He's 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old. And until, I think, last year, maybe the year before, where he's had many surgeries and many injuries, he had never lost a, a single match to anyone else from his home province of Quebec. Never. <laughs> In almost 30 years of competition. Not not won a tournament. Just never even dropped a match against a fellow Quebec puller. <laughs> yeah. Astronomical arm wrestler. Astronomical arm wrestler. Can I just ask a question as well? 1996, was Marcio Barboza pulling? Yeah, he's not... not He's not in the results, so I don't know if oh, he. 
Yeah, I don't know about in that event. Yeah. No, he, no, he, oh, he, I know he was arm wrestling. Yeah. He'd already won world championships, but. He uh, wasn't top 60 AU contract, so I don't know if it's because he wasn't there or. Not yeah, because sure. I, I remember when we, he won the world title in 95 in Brazil, and then he got second place, I think, or second, se- yes, I think it was second place. Uh, in uh, 96 at Virginia Beach. Right. Um, and I wondered whether he pulled the Yukon that year. If he did, he didn't place. Mm, sure. Interesting. Yeah, so in the middleweight... He... Sorry, go, go Mike. I'm just going to finish the middleweight class. So John Bill Silva, followed by Aaron Langeel, another fellow Canadian, uh, Kevin Bongard, and Mike Silieris. So tough classes, tough classes. Yes, absolutely. But... There's another underrated arm wrestler as well, Kevin Bongard. And... Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if Kevin was underrated, to, you know, by today. I just think people don't know him. Back then, no one underrated Kevin Bongard, the people who knew him. By mm-hmm. today, people don't realize how good he was because they just don't know him. Kevin, Kevin Bongard is such an interesting – because he's, he's such a tall, skinny-looking oh. guy. So you, is, you don't expect to see that come out of that guy. He's unbelievable. Yeah. And, then he and was, the fact that he was so powerful in the hook. He's like yeah, Tom, exactly. Tom Holland. The lean machine, Tom Holland, he, is Tom Kevin Bonker. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then you named a, a name, uh, Aaron Langell. Uh, I, Aaron Langell technically is him and Gashevsky were technically the two best arm wrestlers currently that have ever lived. Aaron Langell wow. could pull any. Anywhere on the table, he could transition between moves, between top row and a hook and a press and back and all around. And, I mean, if you even got close to pinning Aaron Langell, that move, that match was about to change directions quickly and properly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, certainly uh, he'd go anywhere. Not yeah. Long. I mean, if he, he was never uh, incredibly strong, he was just incredibly smart. And had the elbow joint and shoulder to be able to move around the table. I mean, yeah, it was rubber. Oh, and he, he, the guy originated Matt Mask's career. His brother Dion, obviously, traced back the origin of uh, yeah. No Limit Stephen Lara. Yeah. yeah, lineage. Yeah, Aaron. Aaron was at my house one time, and you know, we've all any the whole time pretty much. I lived in Utah. Practice was at my house, and for a while it was at. Uh, Bill Brzezink's house, but you know, one day John and you know, normal practice, and Aaron's there, and I love pulling Aaron because we both knew where to go and how to arm wrestle and switch and transition, and uh, they were my absolute favorite practices ever. It was pulling with Aaron, love that guy. Yeah, good dude. I haven't seen Aaron in years, and and that and any was so obsessed with the sport. My God. <laughs> yep. Oh, I mean. You know, medically obsessed. Yeah. He, cl- he definitely had an addiction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. good on you. In the Supers that that. Year, Super's that year, 96. So Gary Goodridge at that point, like, he, he won easily, I would say. Like, he at 95, 96, Gary was at a level that was, it seemed no one was even really close. Um, Jerry Hatterick took second. Ron Bath third. Eric Wolfell, Mike Davis, Reggie Ward. Um, and Dodd Jones once again, one or sixth in a row. <laughs> right. Uh, and that was that was uh, the last pro Yukon Jack tournament, unfortunately. I guess they, 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 the company felt the, the promotion had run its course. They were satisfied with what they accomplished. They did. They stuck around one more year, but amateur tournaments only and an amateur final. What but, a great shame. Yeah, exactly. Because that was, that was the event for many years there in the mid-90s. That you wanted to prove you were the best in the world or the best pro puller in the world, that was where you did it. Um, Absolutely, yeah. The, the, it was the it was the almost like the forerunner of what you see today from the Lottie Tour or Never Off Cup of Old. Yeah, right. it, it was it was the sort of names and faces show. It really yeah. was, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it shall be missed. My God, yeah. the Yukon Jack was ace. Absolute quality, and you get the merchandise. You know, you get the jackets and the bags and stuff. Yeah. It was just a nuts. Right? It's good gear, on it? Absolute quality. The Yukon Jacks. I God rest have, you. I just had my Yukon Jack jacket returned to me after fifth. My my jacket was missing for years. I didn't even realize it was missing 
and then my dad opened up a box in his house from 15 years ago or whatever the heck it was and said, hey, I just found this in a box. I'm like, holy crap. So I, I still have uh, my Yukon Jack jacket. I also have my Yukon Jack jacket, mate. Yep. Uh, but I'm not going to say that mine got lost. It's just that the guy that used to fit that, Uh, let me tell you now that stack large is not going on this man it's gonna (laughs) that's gonna be handed down to one of my sons when they get up to that size because i'm never getting in that that boy again the the size 30 waist jeans as well get an elastic band fitted on those bad boys ladies and gentlemen oh yes (laughs) back in the years before i was sponsored by donut (laughs) <laughs> yes yes <laughs> so so while while Yukon Jack was the main story in those years there were other big events not as many but if we go back 91 uh Bercy France the Super Bret de Fire tournament uh Yo. so that was that was quite a spectacle you know they would have the, the pullers would ride in on motorcycles yeah, and yeah. Nancy Locke had her ass out with a number one written on it <laughs> yeah still got the nervous twitch so there is footage of this as well. So this is, I think, Arms Square Videos has this footage. Um, but um, mate, that was broadcast in Europe on, on Eurosport. Oh, really? Yeah, professionally broadcast on Eurosport. Somebody must have that footage. I mean, yeah, right. you know, it was it was it was all over Eurosport. It was quality at the time, and we had some of our guys. Tony Duray was over there pulling the lunatic. Yeah, the um, CDs. It's one of these events that sort of I've I've been told it sort of over promised and under delivered in terms of prizes. It, it initially was supposed to be money, then it became diamonds, and but, and I think then they I think they gave diamonds, but but like Leanne won her class and she got her diamond appraised. It was nothing close to what they said it was worth, you know. So there was some of these shenanigans going on, but nonetheless, entertaining footage if you can find it. Oh, the Canadians, yeah. the Canadians did very well. Uh, Paul Chikini won his class. Um, Gary Goodridge won the Supers in a match against John Merzink. If you watch the footage, there was sort of a clear elbow foul, but the refs didn't see it. Anyway, so Gary won that on that day. Um, Nancy Locke won the lightweights. Leander Friend won. You got another day. Canadian kid who was in the final with Cobra, I believe. Uh, I'm trying to think of the odds name. Must have. Mario Dore. Mario yeah, Dore. it looked like a cross between Super Mario and a porn star with massive arms. <laughs> And that match was that match was a war. That was a, great a match. good match. Mm-hmm. He yeah, when you actually took the two because that was when Cobra was was at his absolute leanest. I mean, he literally was unbelievably lean. There was not an ounce of spare on him at all. Yeah. You know, when he had that swagger, amazing. Barry Adore, that was probably his biggest. He's won Canadian nationals, but that was probably one of his biggest events. Um, Steve Marneau, also a local puller here, he who's won Wild Worlds, and he won his class. He won the 90, I think above 90. Uh, Sharon Ramez won the 90 KG class at that tournament. Dominantly. I mean, yes, yes, yes. I mean, yeah. it was, class. it was not comparable to Yukon Jack in terms of the depth. There weren't that many. There was only a handful of Americans, uh, some Canadians and a few from different parts of Europe. So it wasn't as, as deep a field. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a you know it's a classic event. Uh, a lot of the best people were there, and uh, some of the best people were there, and so that was only a one-time event. But uh, anyway, our sport is peppered with these one-time events, uh, so that's one of them from the early nineties. Classic, uh, classic that, controversy in the finals as well in the heavyweight final. Yeah, exactly. With John and Gary. Yeah. With uh, John, uh, let me tell you now, there was some flying elbows going on there from exactly. Mr. Goodrich. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, Absolute classic. If you can catch that footage, guys, the Parry Gross to uh, get over there, but see that. And then if you if you if you compare the 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 Golden Bear throughout the nineties and the WAF Worlds throughout the nineties, it just the level <laughs> goes similarly up, and it's really the Eastern Europeans who climb up to the very very top. But if you look at and and Neil, you can speak to these events much more because you were there for most of these. I have not been, but I look at the results. You know, up to the late eighties. Americans and maybe a couple of Canadians swipe, or, or sorry, they, they they win every single class, and then you get into the nineties, and then the transition starts to happen, and uh, it's uh, 
it, it's it's something to behold in the by looking at just looking at the results. But I don't know if you have anything you want to talk about. Uh, well, um, we're we're coming to the end of this episode. We're sort of fifty five minutes in, and I, I actually think also it might be interesting for people out there if at the next uh, the next seating that we do, if we cover golden bears. Right. And we get into the the era of the WAF worlds. Yeah. I also think it's worthwhile bringing the Enigma of Rage, Engin Terzion, ah. because another individual is obsessed by that period of time, very historically knowledgeable, and I think that might make things very yeah. interesting as well. And, and okay. yeah, Engin's memory is <laughs> what makes him so. In, you know, ever try to have a debate with Engin? <laughs> very difficult because his memory is unbelievable. And chances are he's right. He just he just remembers it so well, you know. And, but uh, yeah, that's and awesome. that's also because when most people's children are tucked in their bed at night, and you read them, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears or Little Red Riding Hood, Engin reads Emir results of World Championships from the late <laughs> yes. Yes. The man yes. is obsessed with arm yes. wrestling. More yeah. than anyone I've I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Bless That's, him. He loves it. it. Yeah, I mean, he's in my opinion. You know, when you I, I like to talk about pound for pound conversations, and the best arm wrestler, in my opinion, pound for pound, not not necessarily the strongest or the hook or the top roll, whatever, but just the best arm wrestler, pound for pound, in all time history is Ingen Tierney. He's certainly in the conversation, Bobby Brown. He's certainly in that conversation. You know, you'll get people jumping in the comments and talking about uh, the GOAT and, all, and you know, saying that he's the pound-for-pound pound guy because of the fact that a lot of his career was in the 80 and 90 kilo class. But Engin Terzi was astronomical at his best. Yeah, absolutely. Astronomical. Phenomenal arm wrestler. And it'll be yeah. great to get Engin's insight. I'll give him a buzz and uh, we'll see if we can maybe get him on. I think we'll have some fun there. Awesome. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up this episode of Arm Wrestling Old School. I want to put a big thank you out one more time to my co-host here, Bob Brown of the United States of America and Eric Rison of Canada. Uh, remember, Eric, tell these guys where they need to go to to check this stuff out in more detail, mate. The ArmWrestlingArchives.com uh, for a lot of detail. And then the, the Arm Wrestling Archives Facebook page uh, has a lot of daily daily uploads of little tidbits of arm wrestling history. Ladies and gents, really hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, on behalf of myself, Bob and Eric, uh, if this is your first time, Supernatural Strength, please like, share, subscribe. And until we do this again, ladies and gents, take it easy, peeps. What grabs your eyes on that, if anything? <laughs>